Hey everyone, welcome to What the Flick Feud, uh, Betty and Joan episode three, Mommy Dearest. Jason Grace Alonzo. Uh, again, I think you know the, the 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 parallel tracks of this show and the you know it all comes down to the line from from whatever happened to Baby Jane. All this time we could have been friends. Mm -hmm. Joan and Betty, for all the things that they they hated about each other, they had a lot in common, including their troubled relationships with their daughters. Although obviously they had very different relationships with their, with their own mothers. Yeah, this episode does a really good job of showcasing the commonalities that these two women shared with each other. And I, I like the scene where they sit down and they're literally, I mean, they're they're breaking bread in the way that you would do in old Hollywood, which is over martinis. Right. And just sort of understanding where they come from. We learn a little bit about Joan's history, which I think is really crucial to understanding um, who Joan Crawford was. And I, I really did like uh, Jessica Lange's performance in this episode particularly. I've, I've, the first episode was a little bit of an adjustment because I think even I was uh, maybe thinking there'd be a little bit of Faye Dunaway in there. <laughs> like I'm used to the camp impersonations of Joan Crawford, sure. but this was a great episode for Jessica Lange and for Susan Sarandon of just showing why these women are the way they are, what they had in common, and uh, the underlying theme for this whole episode was the the relationship with their mothers and the relationship as mothers to their daughters, which was really beautifully portrayed. And uh, Kiernan Shipka yes. just does an amazing performance as BD. Um, mm. And I and, and you know I was laughing out loud too when they were showing uh, BD auditioning or like <laughs> running lines yeah. because I, I always forget that that opening scene uh, when we first with the neighbor girl talking about the their neighbors is kind of clunky. Yeah, but it's part of what makes it fun. <laughs> something that you love about whatever happened to Baby Jane. Well, I've never so I've never seen whatever whatever happened to Baby Jane. I've never seen the movie. I, I have not. I, I know. I know. So I can only talk about the show as I'm watching it. But <laughs> one of the things about Ryan Murphy shows that. That either it can go that can go one or two ways. Either they get exponentially better as they go along, or they like go off the tracks. You know, normally with shows like American Horror Story, um, not OJ, not the OJ um, one he just did, but you get into the you get into one or two episodes in, you start to think, okay, now I'm bored. Now it's more of the same. And I felt watching um, this last episode of Feud, I want to see more of them making the movie. Versus getting more of their backstory, at least for me, because it seems that it seems as though I'm I'm Team Betty. I'm just gonna say off top, I'm Team Betty. I, I like the way she's so just balls to the wall, very transparent, really kind of rough around the edges. Not the glamazon that Joan is, and I feel like Joan always comes across very needy, very manipulative, and it's and the story's becoming to me more of. Um, how can we one up each other? Because that's what a feud is. But I personally would love to see them actually make the movie and really get into to the scenes of the movie. Does that make sense? Versus their backstory. I, I guess I think that they're using the movie more of a as a jumping off point to sort of make a larger statement about aging women in Hollywood and how women are pitted against each other and and sort of you know the studio system. Like I think they're 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 running a lot of things through Baby Jane into other ways. And so I think Baby Jane is really more of a conduit than a we're gonna show you how we shot every single I, sequence yeah. of this movie. But I think them I think the making up stuff is really interesting though. The whole thing of them being at the beach and her going back to the dressing room and tying her neck back and you know just all those little details are great. Um, I want to we haven't really mentioned the a lot of the supporting characters and I just want to give a shout out. I think Dominic Burgess is Victor Buono mm -hmm. is totally nailing it, and oh, God bless Judy Davis. Mm -hmm. We we don't get enough Judy Davis in our diet, mm -hmm. and uh, she is being such a great head of hopper on the heels of uh, Helen Mirren doing a really fun, an awful head of hopper in Trumbo. I don't know if y'all saw that one. Oh my gosh, yeah, but that's uh, such a different characterization. Yeah. Wow. But I same, totally same person. forgot that that's the same <laughs> character. You're all right. I, I do agree with you that that the movie is the conduit for the the whole story. I'm, I just don't want it to go from. Okay, we're another American Horror Story Coven. You know, it was based around the witches and, and the history of New Orleans, and you have this other backstory about Fiona and Cordelia, and it's just you. you you, I, you, you, I don't want to lose interest in what inter, what interested me in the first place, which was the movie. And also, I know there's a lot of Jessica Lange fans out there, but I feel that Jessica Lange plays the same role in these roles for Ryan Murphy all the time. The, her Joan Crawford can easily be compared to her Fiona Good in, in American Horror Story because she's not really giving you for me, anything that's um, outside of what she's normally done, she's like her, hmm, or just her whole approach to the way she talks about things. Her her whole attitude seems very familiar to all the roles she's played within the box of, of I, Ryan Murphy. I'll tell you, I haven't watched. 
I, I, the only, Coven was the only American Horror Story I tried to watch, and midway through, I gave up on it because it just went off into Noodle Land. Um, I, I'm as so, in Asylum and all the other. American okay, yeah, Horror no, that, that, that's what I hear. So I don't feel like I'm missing anything because everybody I know who watches those shows gets annoyed with them at some point. But I like what she's doing here in that I think that when in, in those scenes where she is called upon to reenact. Crawford's performance in the film, I think she's really nailing it. And when you see the movie, I think you'll be surprised at how well she's doing that. But I think she's also kind of providing a level of sympathy that is totally different from what Faye Dunaway was totally doing different. in Mommy Dearest. I mean, a friend of mine likes to say that Faye Dunaway in Mommy Dearest is giving an opera performance, like mm -hmm. almost literally at times. Christopher, Christina. Opera, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and so I think this is a, a much more sort of Human sized, you know, Joan Crawford, but still, that Joan Crawford is always a movie star. Well, and I really like how they dealt with um, Mommy Dearest, is a huge sort of question mark on how they were going to treat Joan Crawford in this show. And yeah. I think they addressed it head on with the card in Christina's opening night of her performance. Because yeah. Christina was an aspiring actress for a time. Yes. And um, Joan struggled with that. And you sort of, you see that dynamic at the table played out in the very ladylike way that I would believe Joan Crawford would have played it rather than the over the top way that we saw Faye Dunaway. Sure. Do. And two, um, so. <laughs> and, it, and they're at Perino's, did you notice? Yeah, I'm, yeah. Which that's is a, Faye Dunaway tells Perino's is my joint. <laughs> that's a big set piece. Like they made, these are a lot of interesting choices that this show yes. has made. Like Perino's is is where she basically, that's her office, yes, step into my office. Totally. Um, and you still see her sign Mommy Dearest, which I do think is also so intentional and so clutch um, to acknowledge that she still is the, she views herself as the matriarch greater than right. uh, her children, but well, still is not a, a, a woman uh, lacking in compassion. She, you know, she's not a heartless wench. Yeah, yeah, we're seeing so many levels of her. Because on the one hand, it's like she was this self-made person who was you know scrubbing toilets at age 12 and nobody Nobody gave her a break, and she, you know, she, and that's true. she powered her way through. And so now, the last thing she wants to do is spoil her children in any way. She wants them to, to fight and strive and work for everything that she did, the way she did. But at the same time, she wants to love them and, and accommodate and them with the with the stuff she's got. And then on top of that, you've got this whole child sexual abuse angle, which sort of talks. I think kind of feeds into why she would sort of throw herself at all of her directors and, and also use sex as a way to get what she wants. You know, I think this this is. A, a much more compassionate and layered examination of Crawford's life. I completely agree, and I think it also feeds into how she was able to climb the Hollywood ladder because she was sexually abused um, at a young age, and but she was also able to examine, because she's smart, this is a brilliant woman, she was able to examine the dynamics between women and men and how she could use that Absolutely. to her own advantage. And that's the, that's the sort of thing that Betty Davis never engaged in. So they rose to stardom in very different ways, and they became different women. So when you see them sitting across the table at each other, just totally different perspectives on how to play this game and what is important. For Joan, it's glamour, and for, for Betty, it's the performance. Work, and Joan's yeah, like, I never yeah. needed to get where I had to get because of a performance. I got it because I willed myself there. Um, you, and could, you could do a whole one act play, I think, I of know, the two of them at that table I kind of with, those, just, with those cocktails. To sit there and do yeah. a little, like, this This is a monologue from Joan, and this is a monologue yeah. from Betty, and how they responded. What, what I want to say uh, to you, Jason, so, so you haven't seen the movie, I'm not but seen what I can tell you- I can't believe I have not seen this it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You will. You will, and you'll love it when you do. Um, what I would say is that I think that the way they are using the movie to uh, as a plot device for the show is actually really cool and. Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is just the beginning to their story because we haven't even gotten to the Oscar run yet. I was gonna say, this is the end of episode three and they just wrapped. Yeah. So and we've got five more episodes so Jane, all about the release yeah. and the Oscar campaign right. and, and the and next, then the next movie, movie. So and, Baby Jane yeah. was a catalyst for bringing these women these women in this, on the same set in the same room to, have, to engage with each other in a way that they'd never had to before, that they weren't interested in doing before. But it really was just sort of setting the stage. These first three episodes are really just sort of the exposition, especially the, the pilot, the first First episode mm -hmm. is just the exposition, um, and we will see how things just totally come to a boiling point. Like we haven't even gotten into the feud yet. Like we don't even know the reason why. Yeah, this is all prologue. Yeah. When, when <laughs> Betty Davis was asked about Joan Crawford in a later interview after Joan had passed away, she said, "I was. I, my mother told me never to speak ill of the dead. So Joan Crawford is dead." No, 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 what no, no. It? Ben got this joke wrong too. God damn it! It's, you should. I was told you should always speak good of the dead. Yeah. Joan Crawford is dead. 
Good. Good. Yeah. Wow. So that's the joke. Thank God. So yeah. Uh, Thank you for saving me. <laughs> um, so no, I'm fascinated to see how this is going to play out mm -hmm. because yeah, there's so much. So uh, much. There's more. so much good stuff to come. And I, and then I hope, and that's what I hope. Like I said, because with previous Ryan Murphy shows, we always have faith that it's going to get better and better and better. And right. you even say yourself, Coven, which was by far my favorite of the American Horror Story um, installments, was. It's, it's, they start strong, they start heavy, and also they have they always have a great backstory to build upon. They always have some history to draw from to give them the content. But then you think, okay, well they have this movie, they have this relationship between these two women, and then the writing goes in a whole different direction, and you feel like, wait, what am I watching? It's almost as if you're you're taken up in this this roller coaster and it's left there. Instead of going on the ride, you're like, okay, well, are we going to do this or are we not? <laughs> and then before you know it. It's over, and you have this anticlimactic anti experience. I'm hoping that's not what happens with I, this. I, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed that, as with American Crime Story, that when Murphy is dealing with nonfiction, mm -hmm. he can't wander too far off into these little adjuncts that aren't interesting or whatever. That he he has to follow because I mean, this is a juicy story. I mean, the, right. the, 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 there's already several books about them separately and together. Uh, you know, if he can just follow this story from start to finish, he doesn't have to go anywhere. Crazy. It's there, it's laid out for him. Exactly, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it will be laid out for you all next week. We hope you'll join us then. Thanks.